check out this mug. How's it going, everybody? It is your favorite apostates. I am McKay. And I'm Jordan. And before we get started, um, if you didn't notice our post the other day, we are live on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify. So you can find the links to both of those in the description. Again, to reiterate, it's just there if you want to just listen and you don't want to keep the YouTube app or you can't stand that I touched my hair, which I've had to correct again today, um, then you can listen to the audio-only format of this show. Or if so, you have friends that only listen to podcasts. Yeah, if you're a podcast like our person. Stuff. Yeah. Um, being a YouTube person is tough, honestly, <laughs> because YouTube uh, kind of sucks sometimes. Anyway, so there's that. Also, happy Yay! arbitrary and to cyclic- cyclical timekeeping uh, time unit. There you go. To every one of you, happy new In year. In other words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, we figured since it's going to be the end of the year, we would do a Q&A. Um, that doesn't mean that we're not going to get to the other temple ordinances that we said we would do. And many of you have requested, uh, but we want to make sure we have our shit straight uh, so we can touch. There's a lot of stuff to touch on. Uh that goes beyond just what goes on today. Anyway. Anyway. So Jordan put up on Instagram um, a little question box thing so people can submit their questions. There's a lot of questions that I've also been seeing on YouTube. So thank you, everybody who threw them in there. We're just going to kind of rapid fire, go through them, and uh, answer them as we go. Okay. Okay. This is not organized. Um, <laughs> you guys asked a lot of questions. We're, we're, we're bringing the quality content today. And I do not want to like go through and organize each of them. So I'm just going to. They're oh my gosh, my nose place. will not stop itching. <clears throat> this happens to me every time we do a video. Okay. So we're just going to start with some of them and kind of bebop around. And it's probably not going to make logical sense. But here we are. What ifs? Do you still have a good relationship with your Mormon family? Define good. <laughs> Hopefully none of them are watching this, uh, but if they are, then they've already told me that they don't. So, uh, more or less. Um, it's better, relationships function better when you draw boundaries. So, we said no religion and no politics and things seem to be going okay. It's just kind of still With awkward. With my family, at least. Yeah, it's... How do you have a relationship with your family when, like, literally... And these are their words, not mine. All they do is church. Like, it's the focal point of their lives. They go to the temple once a week. Yeah. They're, they have callings in church. They work at church. They are doing activities during the week they have two-hour yep. church on the weekends like it literally their lives i mean it's the focal point of their lives so it's difficult to adapt yeah. because they don't want to say anything to us because they feel weird about it um we and it's not like we don't want to hear about that stuff like we don't we don't care um, we wouldn't be like, oh my God, you can't talk about the fact that you went to the temple this week. Like we're not going to, yeah. And the day to day stuff is whatever. Cause like, it's, we don't care. It's stuff that we know about. It's stuff that we used to participate in. So, but like discussions about Mormonism oh, yeah, on the whole, no. we're not doing that. Yeah. We don't do that. Um, politics on the whole, not going to do that. We avoid, we avoid that like the plague cause there's just too much differing of opinions. So, um, so and that's just with my parents. That's just with yours. It's a little more complex with Jordan's. My mom works mom. for the church. Um, and her life probably revolves around it just as much as McKay's parents do. Um, but her and I don't really have a relationship. So it hasn't really impacted that because around the same time that yeah. my mom and I stopped talking was when we left the church. So... <laughs> For similar and unrelated reasons, but so there you go. There you have it. The short version of our cocktail of drama. <laughs> Sorry, we didn't have a uh, a more straight answer for you. <laughs> on that one. Um, 
How are missions funded? Missions, generally on the whole, are funded by the missionaries or their families that are going. Um, That being said, like my parents paid for my mission. The way that it was when I was on a mission was everybody in the United States who served a mission paid $400 a month into the missionary fund, basically. From there, they would be the funds would be divvied up depending on the cost of living and other factors. So obviously, like my room and board was probably not four hundred dollars a month in Honduras, uh, but it was kind of scaled to whoever needed the funds more. Now, some people can't afford that, and that's perfectly fine. I wish that they just wouldn't be able to go because. <laughs> It's a waste of time, um, but they can have the uh, the ward members uh, essentially fund a missionary's um, costs every month. So if if parents couldn't afford to pay yeah. for it, then the ward, in most cases, would take on the amount. Um, it's not like the church is in any position to be hurting for money. Um, <laughs> Seriously, they could uh, they could fund everybody's missions for quite a long time. Um, but for everybody whose mind is blown by this, yes, in other words, we just told you that you have to pay to go on your mission. You have to pay to work, and they for dictate free. where you live and your hours, and yeah. So if you ever look at uh, a list of a definition of trafficking, yeah, it hits a lot of those points. There are a lot of kind of missionaries who were subjected to a lot of awful things yeah awful things there's lots of mormon stories podcasts about like really extreme things that happen to people on missions like being sexually assaulted by companions and you know we here in utah we hear about it often where you know missionaries get taken hostage in other countries and missionaries get shot at and yeah recently in the news there was a uh, an entire zone or like an entire mission or something a large amount of missionaries who were all in a chapel and they forgot to lock the door and uh, some armed dudes went in there and robbed every single one of them. It was like a hundred plus missionaries. Every single one of them. And keep so. in mind, these are kids. <laughs> like, uh, th- they're adults. They're but adults, they're but they're very, so yeah, young. Most of them are between the age that you can vote and the age that you can drink, which is most of them leave at kid. 18. So not yeah. developed brains. Okay. Please explain the different levels of heaven and how I am so confused. <laughs> um, we have a nice little TikTok about this. Maybe I'll link it because uh, it kind of explains it a little better. In summary. In summation, uh, you have three degrees of glory. The lowest being the telestial kingdom. The middle one being the terrestrial kingdom and the top one being the celestial kingdom. Everybody who gets baptized in the Mormon church goes to the celestial kingdom. Uh, But if you get to the high, you go through the endowment, you get sealed, you reach exaltation. And we'll talk more about that. Um, Other than that, all the people who were like good, but they weren't Mormon, go to the terrestrial kingdom. The people who were bad and murderous and like con artists and stuff like that go to the telestial kingdom and the people who commit the unpardonable sin which is denying the holy ghost go to outer darkness which is losing your salvation so literally everybody else will be saved except for the people who go to outer darkness which is kind of convoluted because some people have said there are going to be very few people and some people say that apostates like us will be there um, so I'm kind of hoping, you know, <laughs> fingers crossed. That's where we go. Cause it sounds <laughs> lit. Oh God. Also, I'm itching my nose because this happens every video and I can't stop And it. I swear. I don't know if it's my mic. I don't know what happens, but my nose is just like uncontrollably Maybe. itchy during videos. So if you're watching this, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Let's see. We got a lot of these. What made you guys first question what you were being taught? Uh, for me, it was working at the church. You? <laughs> <laughs> That's a short answer. <laughs> working at the church made me, uh, I mean, when you see where the sausage gets made, and it's like a, a cultural thing of people working at the church. They're like, 
if you work at the church, it either builds up your testimony or it breaks it. And it definitely broke it for me because a lot of wasted money. The way that they dealt with COVID, I did not like at all. <laughs> did not. It's, it was really uh, obvious that the church is a business and nothing more. So that's what started it. And then uh, so I was super disenfranchised after working for the church. We were already kind of on a pathway. Yeah, it's not like we were going to, to church like all the time. Mm. We would go enough that because I had to keep maintain a temple recommend in order to work at the church because they can discriminate on religious status. Um, so other than that, it was like I was still super true believing up until that point, but we weren't like going to church all the time. Well, and, plus you were enrolled at BYU, so you had to maintain it, the temple recommend for work and also yeah. for school. So it wasn't really an option to yeah. not be mostly involved. What was it for you? I've always had questions. I always had questions within Mormonism. Um, a lot of it didn't make sense to me, but the Mormon ideal is that you just like answers will come eventually and you just suck it up and deal with it which is essentially what I did um and then I doubled down in later years of high school and in college and basically tried to force it on myself to make it work um lying for the lord to yourself I couldn't do it I had a bunch of questions like people will talk about like shelf items what broke your shelf I had a bunch of shelf items that all sat there quite nicely for a long time um like polygamy and things of that nature so that always sat on my shelf and then uh, once I heard about the second anointing which we haven't really talked about yet but once I heard about that which I had never heard about before and most members don't even know about once I heard about it that was kind of it for me I was devastated by that and didn't know how to process it. We can talk about that one for the temple because it's done in the temple, even That's though true. it's not for even the general temple attending population. That's true. So in short, we have to talk about that. In short, the general authority, like the high up members of the church get in that basically sets them so that no matter what they can do, they'll still get into heaven. So that's really great. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what it was for me. And so I was kind of, not super attached after I found the second anointing. And that was probably what a year and a half or before we left or two. I think so. Yeah. About um, a year and, a half. and then we got on ex-Mormon TikTok, which just kind of sped things along. And then we read the CES letter and that was it. <laughs> Done. I that think there was the a, somebody asked a question, uh, what we think about the CES letter. Oh, so yeah. we'll do a twofer. We'll do a what twofer. What do you think about the CES letter, Jordan? Um, I think a lot of people hinge their break from the church on it because it's it's extremely popular. Um, the CES letter stands for Church Education System, and it was wasn't Jeremy an employer? Wasn't he employed by the church? I always forget I don't remember. his connection. But it was a letter to the director of this uh, the church education system. So basically, this person went to the top he went to the church education system and said you know i have these questions about mormonism these things don't make sense um he laid them out all very neatly um he cited his sources he went deep into doctrine he cited mormon sources book of mormon scriptures um and was extremely thorough about it so wrote this whole beautiful thorough thing and sent it to the church education system and they never responded and eventually he published it and then <laughs> they excommunicated him. Yeah. So, yeah. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Uh, a lot of people treat the CES letter like an antidote for Mormonism, which I just don't think is the case. Um, it's a great resource. Uh, it's definitely not unique by any means. But you can't just give it to a member a true believing member and be like, read this and you'll never go back to church. You have to have had your worldview shifted at least a little bit before you can read that and go, yeah, this is not a church that I would like to belong to. So for us, it was good because we were already on our way out. I mean, the cracks were already there. So it just came in and split the block. Yeah. So. Well, and you have to keep in mind that is, and this isn't true for all Mormons, because I know people are going to come at us in the comments. 
This isn't true for all Mormons, but for most Mormons, I would say the CES letter is treated as anti-Mormon literature. Yep. Um, and there's a lot of fear around anti-Mormon literature. Like when we told family that we were leaving the church officially, one of the first things was, well, what are you reading? What kind of evil stuff are you, are you reading? reading? So yeah. the CES letter is associated with being evil. Yeah. Just like the, the ex-Mormon subreddit. I used to be so... And mind you, my mom was very fear-based and very Satan-focused. So my experience is probably a little different than other people's. But my, I was so afraid of the ex-Mormon subreddit that I would not even go near it. Like, even when we had left the church, it took me a few months to be able to go into the ex-Mormon subreddit without feeling like I was amongst evil people. I will say that the... Uh the vibe there is pretty abrasive a lot of times. It is. It I, is. I'm not a huge fan, to be honest, of the that whole subreddit. Not all the time. It's good. I I participate a lot, but yeah, it's kind of I, I felt the same way. Like I <laughs> I remember one time just because of our geography, I would get suggested posts for R slash X Mormon and I commented to my friend, I was like, damn it, I just wish I would get uh, like banned from that subreddit so I didn't have to see <laughs> funny so yeah how funny the how, tables have turned funny how times have changed do you think all Mormons are bad no no Definitely um not. and people are like oh you guys are just anti listen <laughs> listen listen uh I when people get wrong things when people are totally off base about the church, literally yesterday, somebody was like, it's just sickening that they put Joseph Smith before Jesus. And, you know, I hate more Joseph Smith as much as the next guy. Cause that is definitely the Mormon that nobody should like. But I did have to correct the record and say, no, they don't think that Joseph Smith is above Jesus. So but they do act like it sometimes I'm willing to go to bat for Mormons. Uh, because I don't think the people are bad. But uh, anybody who is a part of that, uh, the Mormon industrial complex downtown Salt Lake City, yes, I, do. <laughs> I don't like those people. Is there, we have this conversation a lot, especially when we first left Mormonism, that, you know, and ex-Mormons talk about this a lot within the community, um, cause it's kind of an abstract concept, but do the general authorities, do the leaders of the church, do they know? Like they, do they know that it's all bullshit? Um, and jury's out on that. Obviously I could easily see it going both directions easily. Um, because you have a lot on the line. That's one of the other questions is somebody was like, all the influencers say that nobody in the church is paid. <laughs> And yeah, they say that, and no, it's not correct. Um, local level church leaders, like members of the the ward or the congregation, bishops yeah. and things at the local level don't get paid. But when you climb that ladder up and get really high up with the prophet and the 12 apostles and... Yeah, you get yearly stipends. You get yearly stipends that are up in the plus $100,000 plus. plus. Figures. So... So, and travels paid room and board a lot of times so so they've got a nice life and it had, you can like in a general authority position like in a prophet or apostle position there's nobody who's been like disaffected from the church in that high of a position um at least of recent yeah in church's history that might be a different story but now as of now there's no in the the prospering era of the church nothing not like really. that has ever happened there's yeah. never been a really high up leader that's dipped like that hasn't happened no um and so i think if one of those people were to leave it would be a lot to lose because one it would be a pr nightmare oh yeah for the church and two they'd lose out on all that money so yeah yeah if somebody saw a apostle effect i mean a, a lot of people are like under the impression that these guys literally talk face to face with jesus so i it would be a shit storm to say the least it is i told i don't remember i don't think it was you guys that i told you i think it was one of our 
it was from one of her ex-Mormon friend groups. Um, when my mom worked for the church, well, she still does work for the church. In a different position, yeah. In a different position than the one she's in now. Um, there were rumor millings about um, one of the one of the 12 apostles, there was a new one that had just gotten called. Um, and so he had like one of his first meetings with the prophet. Um, and essentially the rumor mill, (laughs) this is total bullshit, but essentially the rumor was he went into that meeting with the prophet and then told his secretary that Joseph Smith was in the meeting. These are, and this kind of goes with the questions, are all Mormons bad people? And this kind of answers it for you. This is how deep, deep, deep these people are indoctrinated. And not all of them are like that. There's probably some Mormons that I would tell that story to that would be like, stop. No. No way. That's weird. Um, And so that's not to say that all Mormons would be like, yes, that makes so much sense. But there are so many of them that do. And so there really is a spectrum within Mormonism. We don't hate all Mormons. We definitely see a lot of Mormons that have made themselves aware of a lot of these issues that come and watch our stuff. We have some of y'all that come watch our stuff like religiously um, and then respond to people in our comments to try to contradict what we said and call us out on being biased. No shit. We're Obviously be biased. we're biased. Um, so I think it's hard because you, it's hard to hold indoctrinated people accountable. True. Um, that's just kind of what it comes down to. I don't think all Mormons are bad people. I think a lot of Mormons are ignorant. Um, I think a lot of Mormons are complicit, but on the whole, especially children and teens and adolescents that grow up within Mormonism. Yeah. How do you hold them accountable for not knowing well even the suit like it's even hard. boomers and older generations like my grandmother there was her time there wasn't stuff out there like this there wasn't questions um there wasn't the ces letter there weren't people yeah, no. who left the church that went out and spoke about it so yeah if there was any sort of expose it had to be published in the the tribune yeah and that wasn't the- going to happen so it, it's just it's totally different so, but no, we do not hate all Mormons. There are some shitty ones out there. We'll give you that. For sure. Did you ever actually convert anyone on your mission? Um, I did baptize a couple people. I would say I did convert one person. Um, and it, that's the person that I'm like, damn it. Because I, she was Jehovah's Witness before she became a Mormon. And she's the only one that stuck. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, I had various people that I taught at baptized, but a lot of them, they just like the culture is worldwide. They had no support from the people who were already members. So they came and went and those people I don't really feel bad about, but the one, <laughs> she went on a mission and all kinds of shit. So awkward, not related to Mormonism. Favorite bluey episode. <laughs> This one's for my Australia viewers and uh, anybody with a VPN. Fairy tale. Fairy tale. Season three of Bluey. Blew my mind. It was such it. a good episode. It was such a good episode. I feel like it was the pinnacle of the season, truly. Easily. I don't know how they can beat it. They can't. Um, that and looking at like current seasons that are available on Disney plus grannies 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 is one of my favorites um sleepy time is a doozy man if you want to sob about life child trauma that one will fuck you watch sleepy time um if you don't know what bluey is it's a kid's show that's not really a kid's show it's more like a parent show on Disney plus watch um and it is it is phenomenal. It's and I hate Highly kids recommend. shows. I don't watch cartoons. I don't watch kids shows. It's the only one. Do Mormons typically have shorter engagements before getting married? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. What? Let's see. Um, I got home from my mission in March. Uh, we started officially dating like boyfriend, girlfriend in May. <laughs> like boyfriend, girlfriend boyfriend girlfriend but we had been talking since since march since before my birthday 
March was when so I got So basically home. all of March, all of you April. You say before your birthday, but it was like the day before. It's true. It was. So it was like just a few, that couple of days. So March and then dating in May, talking about getting married in like July, engaged in September. We set our original wedding date for March and then moved it up to the start of the year. <laughs> so <laughs> literally the first week. <laughs> so uh september to january was our engagement and that is not uncommon <laughs> no there's ones that are even shorter than that yep so no they're not uncommon and yes it's because you can't keep your pants on so oh yeah is the underwear comfortable no <laughs> on the whole no no it's the worst thoughts on satanism um uh, don't really know much about it. It's just atheism with more steps. <laughs> That's the reductive version. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, oh. People talk about this, they tem- the, oh, the satanic temple. and They're different though, aren't they? There's the, the Church of Satan and the satanic temple. They're different. They're and different. A lot of people who belong to the Church of Satan uh, don't like the satanic temple. I don't know. I, there's pros and cons with everything. So... Like I said, it's Do just atheism thing. with more steps. I don't feel like I need to belong to another organization. Are funeral potatoes a real thing? Funeral potatoes are absolutely a real thing. It's true. I've never made them, and I have not had them within memory. So I don't even know what the deal is with them. But it I is just a rather super popular dish. Absolutely, yeah. Here in Utah. Were you worried if the other spouse was questioning Mormonism the same time you were? I don't think I really realized I was questioning until you had brought it up. Because we were kind of on the same page. Um, Like, we were being asked when we were going to bless. Because traditionally what you do when you have a child, you bless them and give them a name. Which is a way that the church can put their information attached to your family on the roles of the church. So we were at the point where we were like, like COVID's in full swing and we didn't want to do it. And then I'm also like, I don't know if this is for us. And I, if it, if I don't know for sure, if it's for us, I don't want to involve our son in it until we know for sure. So we both kind of took that stance. Yeah. Both of us is all, have always been critical of the church. I feel like there's always aspects of it that we haven't liked. There's always things that have bothered us and sometimes the same and sometimes they're different. Yeah. Um, but overall, we were both supportive of each other through yeah. all of that because I don't ever feel like we weren't on the same page. There were just some things like that didn't bother you as much as other things. Like yeah. But we were ultimately still on the same page, so it didn't really matter. Yeah. And we got to the, the the same point, which is all that really matters to me. There's a lot of other people who they end up in mixed faith marriages, which is possible. Like, good on them for it's that. It's just really difficult. A, a, a lot of people, people will uh, put their marriage on the line over the church and give people ultimatums, and that is... That's sad. So I hope that's not the case in a lot of other We have friends in mixed religions. faith marriages and it's it's difficult. If you were in that position, we feel for you. Also go to therapy. Go to therapy. Does Mormonism have Masonic roots? We will talk about that more with uh the temple ordinances. There's a lot of stuff that we have to hit on with Masonic ties. It's kind of funny because there's a lot of (laughs) a lot of parallels between a group in the book of mormon called the gadiant and robbers and the goings-ons of the uh masonic panic that was going on around joseph smith's time and his area so that's kind of funny so in essence we'll get into this more in our temple video of the endowment ceremony but yes um masonry and mormonism are there's a very linked a lot of a lot of stuff there 
how do they take 10% of your income? Do you send them your income statements? No, you don't. You do it voluntarily. It's on the honor system. So it's 10% yeah. of your income. You can pay it however you want. You can pay it at the end of the year. You can pay it twice a year. You can pay it every month. doesn't matter. Um, at the end of the year, you will be asked in a separate meeting if you paid the full 10% on all of your income. Um, they don't keep track of, like, they're not going to ask you for tax returns. We get that question a lot. Yeah. They're not thorough like that. It's on the honor system. But if you're paying like the same amount over a few months and then you stop paying, they would probably notice that they're probably going to contact you and ask you what's going on. Um, so I don't think they would contact you, but they contacted my grandmother. Did they? Oh, okay. Yes. Um, so some bishops, this isn't, there isn't policy about this per se. Um, but some bishops, if you stop paying tithing for a little while and then try to get caught back up, some of them won't make you pay for the time that you didn't, and some of them will. Um, we had a bishop that was like, whenever you fall off the wagon with tithing, just get back on. It doesn't matter. Just repent and get back on. Yeah. Um, just pick up where you left off. You don't need to pay back pay. Um, but then my grandmother's also had a bishop that yeah, forced her to pay all that money that she was not paying. Um, I mentioned to someone in the comments, but there was a, uh, they'll hold you hostage over it in some cases. Um, new name Noah, Mike Norton was on Mormon stories describing when he used to counterfeit temple recommends for people. One of the reasons he did it for a person was because his bishop said that in order to go to the ceiling of his child, the wedding, yeah, the wedding, which he needs a temple recommend to do. He could not at obtain that temple recommend until he got up to date on his tithing, which amounted to about $25,000. Uh, so instead, he went to Mike and went for free. That was a long time ago before they had any sort of safety features. But um, Oh, I also want to hit on this. A lot of people, like on the soaking video, they were like, why don't you just lie to the bishop? You absolutely can't. There's nothing stopping you. They, they're not getting your, your bank statements or anything like that. But it's important to remember that the members of the church are indoctrinated to think that God knows all these things and a sin like that wouldn't be able to be made up unless you paid your tithing, for one. And second, they're also taught that the gift of discernment is given to leaders within the church. So if you were to lie... They would know. There's so many tall tales and myths of leaders being able to discern people lying. So like if you were to go moment. and say, yeah, that's 10% of my income, the bishop would be like, really? Are you sure about Is that? Is it really? And then they'd be able to like, no. Yeah. And some people, I mean, uh, some higher ups, I mean, they will trick you into thinking that they have the gift of discernment because they've learned a lot of cold reading techniques and things like that. So it's not anything supernatural or anything. If there is any correlation, um, it's just either interrogating you and getting a confession <laughs> to it's something really, you didn't do or... It's really common in young single adult wards, YSA wards, which are college age students. Um, it's really common because essentially... <laughs> YSA wards have a lot of drama, um, mine sure did. And a lot of, I was on, I went to the rival school of BYU. So I went to the University of Utah. And so we're known as like the party school compared to BYU, which is lame because it's still a bunch of Mormons. But yeah, <laughs> our YSA ward was a disaster and everybody was sleeping with everybody. And so the bishop would just wait around until he heard enough information and then he would call people in because word gets That's around shitty. and so he'd be like how are things going do you have anything oh, you need you to sure? tell me <laughs> but towards the end of my college career um i had a different bishop who was actually quite great um but there's a lot of them who are not so how have you educated yourself so well and become so open-minded that's a very nice thing to say <laughs> My mission, <laughs> my mission is what led me essentially out of the church because it shifted my worldview a hundred percent. So that's, I'm really harsh on people. I'll see people on Twitter or whatever, like, oh, I served in a rough area. Okay. But you're still a prick. So <laughs> did you really learn anything? Because I went to a place that would be considered a rough area 
And uh, I learned a lot and I shifted a lot. Um, so that was the start of my path of being more open-minded. You? <laughs> you looked at me so seriously. Um, Let's hear it, Jordan. <laughs> it was college. College was it for me. And it's the typical. You mean the liberal indoctrination the liberal station? Agenda. Um, which, <laughs> which you just, I grew up in a conservative household. When I went to college, I identified as a Republican. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's had to <laughs> <laughs> kidding. All it, in jest. My first history class in college was like a slap in the face. Um, partially because the United States education system whitewashes everything. And so when you actually hear a mostly accurate rendition of history um, without being whitewashed by white dudes who have racist agendas, um, it kind of throws you for a loop a little bit. So the more time I spent in college, the more I realized this. Um, and then just, I think within the church, if you're like on the fringe of the church when you're an active member, um, and you see things happening with like gay marriage and prop eight and things of that nature. It kind of think it, if you're struggling with it, I think it kind of forces you to form an opinion on where you stand. Cause either you stand with the church and you're firm yeah. in gay marriage is a sin. Um, and there should for should also be like illegal. And so gay like people that. shouldn't be allowed to get married. Trans people can't transition. Um, you kind of are forced to decide if you're on the fringe, whether or not that sits with you, like whether or not you agree with those things. And as time passed within college and even a little bit in high school, I always felt weird about it. Um, it's, it just seemed off to me. So yeah, the, I'm a huge reader. The more we read, I'm in my master's program for social work right now. Um, and MSW programs, if they're a decent one or a big slap in the face, um, for white people too. Um, so there's a lot of focus in there as well. So I think it's at the forefront of what we do because I'm in it constantly with my masters and then yeah. we are doing this. And so we end up, people bring up things and we end up doing lots of research. And I think it just being willing to be flexible and being willing to listen because people will call us out for stuff. We've been called out for stuff for yeah. language changes, for things that we've gotten wrong for people's perceptions of things and how that might influence how we talk about things going further. Um, all of those things. So I feel like if you're just flexible and open-minded and you're willing to research and you're willing to listen to other people who might know about things better than you. <laughs> yeah. It's always, I, Yeah. If you want to leave a comment on something that we may have said that's off base, I see that. I verify it for myself and then I make a change. Like there's and a bunch of there's a, a bunch times. of phrases that I've dropped because I had no idea it's just something I grew up around and I had no idea. So It's true. What are your current beliefs? Nothing for me. <laughs> People ask me that all the, they're like, "Do you still believe in God?" and I'm like, "I don't." feel the need to so that's just me what does jordan think <laughs> that's a quick answer yeah I, i've kind of simplified it i don't i don't feel the need to like expand too much anymore i am more agnostic i feel like um i feel like there's something i don't know if it's a higher power or could be referred to as such um I just feel my views, I feel like, extend more from spiritual experiences I've had and my opinions on the afterlife um, and the energy that humans have. And I just don't think that there's an end to that um, after death. So I think that kind of influences how I view things. I don't necessarily think that just like I know a lot of afterlife belief is tied to Christianity and things yeah. of like especially in the United States is super dominant within Christianity, but I don't necessarily think that an afterlife exists solely because there's a higher power attached to it. Um, I think it's, for me, it's more about the collective. Um, I feel like there's divine feminine masculine energy. Um, I don't really, I don't profess to know all the answers. Um, I think that's kind of 
when you leave Mormonism, Mormons have an answer for everything. Everything's explained. Everything's black and white. There are a few things that are kind of up in the air that they tell you, oh, you'll find out later. There will be revelation in the future. In the future. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, you have the answers to everything. Like what happens after? What do I have to do to get into the highest kingdom of heaven? What do I have to do to prevent myself from, you know, falling and going to one of the lower kingdoms. What is God like? What is the Godhead like? What does Jesus do? Like all of those things are very clear cut and dry within Mormonism for the most part. Yeah. And so when you leave Mormonism, it's, and this is another one of the questions is what is leaving Mormonism? Like it's a, it's a culture shock. (laughs) It hurts your brain. Um, I think recently I've seen a lot of, ex-Mormons attacking other ex-Mormons for how they process leaving the church. Um, Especially people like us who talk about it. A lot of other ex-Mormons shame people who continue talking about the church after they've left. Um, Yeah, they're like, what's up with these ex-Mormons that just continue to, like, fixate on the church? Like, I am still Mormon. The the title ex-Mormon comes from mormon so i feel like i'm entitled to be able to continue talking about my experiences which cover the entire first 25 years of my life so i just don't think we need to shit on people who are no. grieving something <laughs> yeah um do you, like can you imagine going from i have everything spoon fed to me for my beliefs on the afterlife and god to I don't feel the need to believe in anything. So like, I know can nothing you imagine? for sure. Yeah. For the belief it's system that shift. you've been spoon fed and indoctrinated into since birth. Um, Literally. And all your culture is tied to it. Your friends, your family, the people you associate with, <clears throat> what you do on the weekends, what you do during the week, um, your holiday traditions and celebrations, all of those things are tied to Mormonism. And when Mormonism isn't a part of it anymore, it just leaves a huge question mark on everything. I mean, it's it's truly earth shattering because it hits you on every level. Um, and I yeah. feel like it, I feel like I know people say, like, I'm done deconstructing. I don't think you're ever done deconstructing, to be honest, um, especially coming from a, a trauma informed perspective. Yeah. I think a lot of those things if don't you're tired of deconstructing. It's perfectly <laughs> That's one fine. Thing. <laughs> to not be investing your time into like breaking it down and doing those things. That's fine. But in the sense of being trauma informed, I feel like those things will present themselves to you sometimes when you don't expect them to, there will be one aspect of Mormonism that you haven't thought about in a long time that will just hit you one day. And it's like, I hadn't thought about that. And so I don't think the yeah. deconstruction process truly ever ends. I feel like you can, a lot of people, once they leave Mormonism, like, like we did jump headfirst into breaking down everything that we believed and why it wasn't true and spending time digging through all those things, reading books, reading sources, um, doing all of those things so that we, we were confident yeah, in the stance that we have now. And we don't feel the need to do that anymore. Um, I don't read books on Mormonism. I don't read books about Joseph Smith. I don't spend time on that anymore. I don't really want to hear about it. Um, it's funny, I probably read scripture more now than I ever <laughs> did in my day-to-day life behind because when we make videos like about the temple and things like that, I want to brush up and make sure I know my shit. So if people come in, we have to go back literally the only criticism they can have is your guys is bias is showing like okay. okay. Yeah, but what else what is wrong? That's Just fine. Point that out. <laughs> <clears throat> I read some series. I read that they're sitting under the desk right here. I read some thick ass books um, on Joseph Smith. And once I felt like I was confident enough in the positions that I had felt prior, like the things that fell off to me, once I started doing research and reading up on all those things, I was like, yeah, this is why this fell off to me. Yeah. Um, once you give into the anti Mormon sources. Yeah. <laughs> Which it, a lot of. And somebody asked us, how do you approach like family members who were maybe on the fringe of Mormonism or who like don't know what to do when they don't want to look at anti-Mormon literature? One of the biggest things, in my opinion, that lead people out of the church is the church's own gospel topics essays. Um, so these were created by the Mormon church to address 
controversial topics within the church with church material. Um, well, not with church material, with church, with historical accurate or accurate historical material that they accurate. don't more accurate than what they can include in their like lessons and shit like that. So essentially, if you have a question about like the book of Abraham and that nonsense, you would go and read the church's essay about it, which will then validate that the church is in the right. And then you're like, oh, okay. But a lot yeah. of the information in those essays links to things because they can't be totally inaccurate about these things because it would just come off. I mean, it would be provably false. And a lot of things are, but the essays will point you to things that aren't church material. And I think people look at those things and they start to go down that path and they're yeah. like, oh, this is interesting. So if you have a family member that's kind of on the fringe or a friend who's on the fringe and doesn't really know where to start, the gospel topic essays are an easy recommendation because they're condoned by the church. They are. Yeah, they're put out by the church. They're, they're church materials. And they are unsettling at best. Yes. So. I mean, and that's why we say don't hand anybody a CES letter because you can hand a CES letter to a Mormon and they're not going to think anything of it. So. But yeah, CES That's letter is a fun. good source. A letter to my wife is a good source. If you are looking for, if you want to read something that's church history based, um, a letter yeah. to my wife was created by a guy who wanted to leave the church, but his wife was still very much in. Um, and she said, if you compile all this stuff for me with church based resources, then I'll consider reading it. And so everything that he has is a church sourced document. Do you know um, where they can read that? Is it just called Letter to A my Letter wife? to My Wife or Letter to My Wife.com? I'll link it in the bio. And you can also le- read the CES the letter for free at cesletter.org. Yeah, I think yeah. so. They're both very accessible. You can read them online. You don't have to buy them for free, um, which is really nice. So we'll link both of those in the description. But those are the gospel essays and Letter to My Wife or church based. So those are kind of easier starting points. Um, CES letter is if you want to get your world turned upside down kind yeah. of stuff. So I wouldn't recommend that right off the bat. Or if you want to go deep, deep, you can visit uh, Lighthouse Ministries in downtown Salt Lake. Yeah. Sandra Tanner, she's the authority, basically. All those other shit, all that other shit wouldn't exist without her. So. Yeah. they, Her and her husband put together a wealth of resources about Mormonism and why. They're like the original anti-Mormons. They really are. At least for this generation. They really are. Any tips on how to get over the guilt? We feel so guilty for wanting to leave the church. It's caused so many splits. Um, DID, OSDD, which are dissociative disorders. Um, And we want to leave, but we feel so guilty at the same time. Mm, That's hard. Uh, We felt the same way. Uh, We were out of the church for at least a month And we were getting hounded on when we were going to bless our son. And we were terrified to tell people. Honestly, um, even the person that we live with (laughs) who just goes to church, which is fine. um, We were very generally supportive. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't blame you for being nervous or being what's the word they used in there? Guilty. Being guilty, yeah, for feeling guilty about leaving because uh, the implication of leaving the church, especially when you come from like a multi-generational family like I did, um, where you're sealed and things like that, is the um, basically the statement that you're making is that you don't want to be a part of your family's eternal family anymore. Uh, you don't want any part in that, and it can be deeply hurting. But it's also important to know that you're not responsible for their reaction or their feelings because they're basing the feelings of you on the church. So really, if they should be mad at anybody, they should be mad at the church for separating families who don't want to believe the same thing. That's fair. I feel like somebody asked about Catholic guilt. Is it like Mormon guilt? I would say they're pretty much the same. I feel like religious guilt within Mormonism is is heavy, even for active members. I think that's guilt is a huge motivator for Mormons. And so yeah, even, yeah, for sure. I mean, we're coming up on being out for a while. Not almost like a, a while, year. but almost a year. 
Um, and I feel like there's at times things still pop into my head that are like, oh man. And it's kind of the untraining of the brain that you have to do. Um, because those things have been banged into your head for a long time and undoing those, those thought patterns. And a lot of Mormonism is based in thinking errors. And so undoing those things, it's hard to do and it's hard to do by yourself. Um, I feel like the best way to deal with the guilt is to have somebody help you through it, which is all of you guys are like, oh my God, Jordan, therapy again. But that's that's what I would recommend because it's hard to break down indoctrination and religious guilt um, on your own because the only real perspective you have is yours um, and you need someone to help you navigate that especially if you're dealing with things like I know I can list a few um, ex-Mormons that I know who have dissociative identity disorder. Um, I do not, I will not say that there's like a link there, um, but I think disassociation within Mormonism as a trauma response is, is common, Probably, yeah. which is unfortunate, but with something that's serious, therapy <laughs> go to therapy <laughs> for you everyone want, who ever asks you want to lear- know where i learned those things in therapy probably we on both tuesday. go to therapy yeah so probably on tuesday i kind of that kind of clicked for me so it's a process so don't don't beat yourself up don't over beat it. yourself up and be patient like this is an extremely difficult process um, it's a grieving process and you're going to go through those, those stages of grief aren't sequential. Um, it's back and like forth and up would. and down. Yeah. And so give yourself grace. It's different for everybody. And know that you're totally validated and your feelings are absolutely common <laughs> amongst yeah. ex-Mormons. So Probably that's Probably the most widespread. Yeah. I would say. For sure. Did you guys have a wedding reception? Yes, we did have a wedding reception. Um, I think most Mormons do because um, if you didn't, then like more than half of your guests wouldn't be able to attend anything about your wedding so because let, they're not allowed in the temple. So Let's clarify that though. So because we say reception, but for the majority of people, it's probably it's different. It's like an open house basically. Because we don't, for Mormons, and we'll do a video on this temple ordinance, it's called ceiling. And the only people that can attend the ceiling are people who have temple recommends and who have been endowed, who have gone through that process. So children, teenagers, nope, can't go. Um, you have to be, you have to have gone through the endowment. And usually the only reason you do that is if you're getting married or going on a mission. And so for the majority, like your kids can't go to the ceiling. Um, yeah. It's short. My, my younger sister wasn't even able to go to our ceiling she nope. was too young so you just those people just stand outside but i mean it's a short ordinance i mean at max it's 30 minutes but um only the people that have recommends can attend and so you if you have family members that are not mormon or you have friends that are not mormon the majority of mormons want to do something like an open house or a reception because the majority of them would be left out <laughs> of yes. that of that ceremony so there is no for most mormons they don't do like a ceremony there's not like there's not like a walking down the aisle there's not like a uh exchanging of vows like we didn't do vows there was nope. no ring ceremony um, we just exchanged rings right after the little the ordinance was done mm-hmm. and that was it it is really impersonal and yeah we'll talk more about that um, but we did have a reception. It was after our, we got sealed in the morning. Our reception was at night. Um, we actually, we had a really nice venue. It was literally right next to the Salt Lake Temple. So, What's the name of the building, dear? Joseph Smith Memorial Building. Yeah. And people were like, oh my God. But then you look up the building. It's gorgeous. It's it gorgeous. is a beautiful building. So we had a second or third floor reserved Um for a reception and the the main reason we wanted it was because the view outside the window was of the Sully Temple. Where we got married. Where so. we got married. So <laughs> everything when you're getting married and you're Mormon, everything centers around Mormonism. Everything centers around the temple 
everything centers around like when you're getting sealed, who can attend, your wedding dress is based on Mormon standards. You can't just have whatever wedding dress you want. It's got to fit some requirements. So you've got to, it's got to be white enough. My dress will show you. My dress was very white. Um, and when I got to the temple, they still told me that it wasn't white enough to wear it in. So I did not Oops. wear my wedding dress during our sealing ceremony, which is fine because you have stupid shit on. We over pretty it anyway. much knew that going in that it was probably not going to happen. At that point, I was so over wedding shit that I was like, I don't care. Whatever. Um, but yeah, it has to be. It has to cover the garments. So your wedding dress typically has to have a cap sleeve or something at least long enough to cover to cover the garments. Um, so a lot of women either do the cap sleeve or it'll be full length sleeve. sleeves, um, no cleavage. Um, like super form fitting. Lots of Mormon moms get it in a, up in a tizzy about that. Um, I think mine is probably more on the risque side, risque side which you're going to see it and be like, oh my God, really? Um, but the other part of this is because you don't have like a ceremony, because there's no walking down the aisle, because there's none of that. The first time that you see each other is in the temple and like in your <laughs> in your dress and but here and we'll get to this in the endowment video you have to wear the stupid clothes right you've seen the stupid ceremonial clothes the green apron you've seen that right so when you get married when you get sealed in the temple you have to wear that shit over your wedding dress <laughs> so that is so that's horrifying, yeah. right? And so most Mormon couples don't want that to be the first time their husband is seeing them in the wedding dress because the green apron and the veil. kind of, to say the least, kills the vibe. It kills the vibe. So what happens, and this isn't just a Mormon thing. There's other people that have done this, this but it's extremely common with Mormons for this reason. It's called a first look. Um, and it's usually done like really close to the wedding day or a week or so or two weeks before. Yeah, we were like two weeks before. Um, so you, uh, the women wear their wedding dress. They get all dolled up. They look like they would if they were having their wedding ceremony. Um, same for the guy. And then you go somewhere. You're basically separate. Um, you're kept separate. And then you have a photographer or a videographer that comes. And then you do a first look where, you know. He turns around, looks at you, you're like, oh my God, it's the greatest thing ever. Um, and then you probably do either photos or a video shoot. So a lot of people were like, drop the wedding video. We want to see the wedding video. And unfortunately, um, I do not want to share that with you because the wedding one that has our family in it, our family and friends. And it would take too long to blur everybody out. We don't want to out any so, of them as knowing sorry. who we are. <laughs> Um, we're not going to show that to you. So you won't get to see the reception. That but, we did but since it's our anniversary next week, we figured we would share the first look video with y'all. Um, so just to preface, our videographer did an amazing job to set the video to music. Um, but I was like, mm, maybe I should check on this music before I throw it up there. The only place that I could get a license for it was like, you can get a one-time use license for this for $60, or you can get a year's worth of licensing for $250. I already have another service that I use, so I said, fuck that, and uh, I just put different music to it. So it was synced up really nice. She did great, a great job, um, but I ruined it so that it <laughs> doesn't violate so copyright. So we don't, yeah. So, um I let's do a little transition thing. This was four years ago, mind you. Yes. Four years um, ago. You're going to be shocked at how different I look. And um, obviously this is right outside the Salt Lake Temple where we did ours. Yeah. So, so we'll do a little reaction to it. I haven't seen it in a little while, so it'll be kind of nice. I just slapped the music on there and didn't watch it, but I've seen it. Let's change it up and uh, we'll look at that. Okay, so don't laugh at us. This is, uh, <laughs> this is four years cringe. Ago. <laughs> we'll probably just talk over it. Um, cause we don't have to pause it cause with the music change, there's no copyright issues. Anyway, let's go. Oh, there's a familiar face. Short hair though. Ultra short hair. <laughs> Look at those shoes. And there's my beautiful bride, Jordan. That's where our wedding colors. Navy blue and maroon. I stand by that choice.
cute oh. little face. Oh. <laughs> You may know, I was only uh, about six months off of my mission here. I might look malnourished, but uh, it's just because I walked everywhere. <laughs> oh my god. This was back when Jordan still loved me. Oh my god, stop. <laughs> oh, look at that jump. Beautiful temple in the background, right? It's funny, too, because, like, uh, the week before this, I smashed my ring finger in the, uh, against the calipers of a Porsche. <laughs> so that was, that was fun. I forgot about that. That's the Christmas setup at the Salt Lake Temple. That's why there's little things on the water Yeah, this there. was, like, a week or <laughs> so before, oh my, what? This is, like, a week or so before Christmas. And if you, you guys always come on the height difference, it's yeah. very obvious. <laughs> Check it out there. I was not in heels, by the way. Oh yeah, you have flats on. Mm -hmm. Not temple friendly dress. Apparently. Apparently, which is lame. Her height difference is so dramatic. <laughs> this is, uh. Oh, we were also so thin. <laughs> I <don't> know. <laughs> oh, look at that little wiggle. <laughs> Can you tell we're white? <laughs> this music didn't, uh, turn out too bad. I didn't. This is the doors on the Salt Lake Temple. The doors that aren't in use, which no. is odd. None of the exterior doors like that open. But it's a kind of huge odd. photography spot. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm going to pause right here for a second. Oh, oh, yep. Remember the other day when Jordan said that um, she had a boyfriend propose to her at Temple Square? <laughs> this is that bench where <laughs> she got it. Oh, God, why you gotta traumatize me like that? <laughs> Got him. I would always take her over there and I would, like, kneel down to uh, tie my shoe. So rude. As a joke. It's pretty funny. Oh, getting a little hot and heavy there. <laughs> Sheesh. Oh, wow, that faded out really nicely. Um to be honest, I did adjust the timing, uh, the uh, the tempo of the music, so that it would end at the exact same time as the video. But it still looked pretty good. Anyway, uh, what are your thoughts on our video, <laughs> our first look? Uh, leave a comment if you did not expect us to look like that. <laughs> I didn't because I look at myself there and I'm like, oh my god. Then I looked like very vertical. Now I look kind of <laughs> horizontal at the same time. So. <laughs> Also, Same. wow, I have a lot more hair. I had not gone through childbirth at that point, so there was not a <laughs> fat part of me. <laughs> so that is a change. <laughs> we are not fat phobic over here, let's be clear, but it's just crazy to see the difference. Yeah. So that was only, we're coming up on four, that was four years ago officially because uh, uh, we did that prior to, we had to do it like two weeks beforehand because you had Christmas, New Year and it was just going to be crazy. So that was a good time. Our wedding, our reception was a blast. I wish I could share that video with you guys. Yeah, it was... but sorry, y'all. We, we are not looking to uh, share that much of our lives mm -hmm. if it includes other people. So there you have it. Um, yeah, this was kind of a fun little Q&A and a thing to share. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us did you have anything to add to uh, finish it out you guys always ask a lot of questions um which is great <laughs> and we don't get to all of them we don't get anywhere so. near all of them so we always feel bad um but i'm hoping there was a lot of temple questions in this one and i'm hoping i'm confident that we will address the majority yeah. of those in the next video somebody also asked about the mormon influencer series that is still ongoing um 
it's just kind of taxing sometimes because how do you look into people that you don't give a shit about and like yeah. find things we gotta do them, deep so. dives on people and you know it's kind of a pain so that's still in the works as well it's just probably i mean right now it's we taking to backseat do, yeah. to temple stuff but that's not to say we're never going to return to that because it obviously it, in- it interests you guys quite a bit. So we do want to continue to spend time on that. But the next video will be about some temple ceremony. I'm not sure which one we're going I to think, do. I think we'll just go in the order of what you do. So we'll talk about the n- initiatory and a lot of other things to set up for the endowment. Because the endowment one is going to be really long. We might have to split that into two. And if we rope it in with the... There's a lot to talk about the initiatory, which is actually pretty short. But... Um, there's a, a lot, lot we need to ch- talk about with changes that they've made the to Nike it. The one. Oh, yeah. So, anyway, uh, if you made it this far, I hope you did because uh, <laughs> I think everybody needs to see that video and just see how <laughs> goofy we looked. Um, thanks for watching. If you haven't subscribed already and you like what we do, hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button, too. That helps us out. Um, if you would like to support us, we have our Etsy store, Happy Brain Collective. And uh, our Teespring, which are down in the description. We also have a Patreon. We had a bunch of patrons join. And we love our patrons. I need to update probably after this video goes up. I'll update the patron slide at the end so that you can get your name on our videos. We thank you. We love you. You're amazing patrons. Um, if you want to follow us on social media, you can find us at Jordan and McKay on Instagram and TikTok. Did I miss anything? shout Uh, out to the discord discord um i think that's it we do updates on instagram daily and that's usually where i put questions like for q a's so if you want to be involved in that i would highly suggest that you follow us on instagram um plus we give updates and things on there and we ask for feedback on stuff so we also recently did uh, an experiment about soda so we did we did check a taste it out test. it's kind of fun it's saved to our highlights if you want to go watch it it's really funny anywho uh thank you for watching everybody and we will see you next time